What's happening, fellow audio engineers and music producers? This is DJ RHR, and in this three-part video series, I'm going to tell you how I took Purple Hat Mob's Access Denied single and took it to the next level. So I want to thank Vitaly Justice of Red Barn Productions and Firestorm Records for participating and being my opponent in Mix War Number 1. I thought we had a rocky beginning, but as things turned out, it was pretty neutral in the end. So I respect him and respect his hard work. Go check out his channel. I'll link it below. So in part one, we're going to take a look at my mix prep and a comparison between the original unmixed audio and what I was able to get in the end. In part two, I'm going to be going over the mix session yet again. But instead of just showing you the plugins, I will tell you what I did with them and why I used them. In part three, I'll be talking about a topic I've never talked about on this channel before, and that is mastering automation. This is the final step to take your song to the next level and make it sound polished and professional. So, let's get started. The first thing I wanna show you guys is the before and after of some parts of this mix, the main parts of the mix, we have the intro, we have the lead guitar part, we have the first verse and the chorus with vocals. So to say that neither I or Vitaly Justice could get a perfect mix, well, guess what? It's not going to happen with these recordings. And once you hear them, you'll understand why. But I'll say that both me and him were able to polish a turd pretty darn well. And as far as I'm concerned, chasing the perfect mix with imperfect recordings. And I'm not even saying that, you know, if you go and listen to some of the other before and after mixes that I've done, it's the same thing where it, it starts out sounding muddy and you really don't know what your final result's going to be until after you've tweaked the living crap out of the tracks. So here we go. I'll just play this and then we'll go immediately into the mix prep part of the video.
So if you want to learn how I polish the turd, keep watching. So the first thing I did was put this vocal into Isotope RX-6 and got out the pop peas. There were about maybe 10 of them on each vocal track and that took care of that. And I went through not every single track back to back, but most of these main tracks and cut out any noise I may have heard and really just if you see what I what I did I did some automation this is again the mix prep session so I did uh, some general automation to even out the vocal levels and then the plugin I have on the lead vocals here we have Hornet VU meter mark 4 it's got the levels right around analog 0 and let's see, did a little bit of cutting in this range. I ended up having to do even more cutting in the 200 and 400 hertz range later on. But uh, let's see, we got this. And I don't, yeah, see these were dynamic EQs. Cutting out the some of the vocal stuff. And then going down the line, de -esser. Magenta, doing some presence cutting at around 3K. My favorite compressor overall, <laughs> do not take this away from me, it's my Desert Island compressor, the LA-3A. Let's see how much compression I was getting. Smart Comp. I still have not reviewed this plugin yet, but I'm telling you guys, this might be the plugin of the year just because I'm not going to say it's the only compressor plugin you need, but basically it's like an invisible, just, it just makes things just, oh, I love it. I love it, what it can do. It's so easy to use. You just, you hit this button. It detects the controls and then you just lower the threshold until it sounds bad and then you uh, raise it back up. So it's just, yeah, I love it. And make sure you had the spectral compression on. I don't like the makeup gain so much, but it, it does it automatically, whatever. And of course we have tape because back in the day, everything was recorded to tape. And in this case, I use tape as another form of DSing by putting the VTM bias set to the low setting. And also the more muddy sounding tape machine is the, the 456 tape formula or tape type. And also under my settings, I for some reason had my noise up to its default and the bass alignment was also zero by default and I knocked both of those all the way down. Finally, we have SAN 3 preamp going into line input 15. <laughs> so, yeah. And then let's see, the other vocal basically got the same exact plugins, except I think Hornet maybe boosted it a little bit more or something. But yeah, here, here they all are. I didn't really change anything. It was basically just me copying and pasting these plugins. And let's see. Yeah, I even forgot to change the line input. <laughs> On to, let's, let's do the guitars, all right? So guitar, again, Hornet for gain staging. And the problem with, the lead guitar was actually, I think, recorded okay. Like, I didn't really have that much issue with it. Here I knocked down the low end, and we used a API 550A emulation. I was boosting at 5K and cutting 200 for clarity. I guess I should play this in solo for you guys because talking about it's one thing, but actually hearing it is a whole other. All right, so I'm gonna do a before and after with the EQ and other stuff. So 
See, it's fizzy, and that certainly hurt the quality. I think one thing people got to realize is when you're recording guitar amps, you should really tweak the gain so that it's overdriven, but it's not like that nasty overdriven because that nasty overdriven does not sound good in a mix. You need to basically be on the precipice of getting that nastiness, but not fully getting it. But overall, I don't think the lead guitar sounded too bad, especially once I started EQing it. So here's the two EQs. And then going into an LA-3A, which is my favorite for electric guitar. Acoustic guitar, mm, to an extent. But yeah, I really like it on electric guitar. And then I ran that into tape. It softens the nastiness a little bit. And then I, I also ran that into SAN 3's preamp, SSL line input emulation. Going on to the other guitars, the two rhythm guitars. This was a double playing and usually double played guitars, double track guitars, I like to just spread them 100% left and right, almost by default. So just going down the plugin list, um, don't really need this plugin anymore, I, I can delete it, just use that for gain staging. And we have, again, a cut at 80 hertz, because I don't need regular guitars taking up the bass guitar region or the kick drum region. All right, we got a Volco Audio QA, which is a API 550A emulation. I did a five kilohertz boost and a cut at 400 hertz, which is actually a shelf cut. So I really cut it. And then that was going into an LA-3A and that was going into tape. And finally, it looks like I didn't use the SAN 3 preamp. Interesting. I must have just forgot to turn it on. <laughs> Maybe I didn't like the way it sounded. Anyway, because of that, I can actually get rid of it. And we'll do a before and... Well, see, I don't want to do a whole before and after because if you look, you see how close that was tracked to zero? So I'm just going to do a before and after with the basically everything after Hornet. Now I'll put the plugins on. I don't have this pulled up, but in another prep session, which I don't even know which one it is at this point, <laughs> but I did actually end up automating this part right here so that it was a lot closer in volume to this part. Now, ironically, I believe if I take these plugins off, this part was actually tracked at a good volume. Yep. Again, look, it's possible that somebody actually just made this clip louder, 
with like a digital boost or something. So maybe it wasn't recorded this loud, but I can only judge based on the tracks I was given. And this was definitely too hot coming in. So on to, let's just go to the bass guitar since it's the next one down. Bass guitar got a lot of work. <laughs> so first of all, it too was tracked quite loud. Hornet gave it a negative nine designation. You can see how it peaks quite high. And I noticed that it, it definitely had like a direct box type of sound to it. Maybe that wasn't the case, but take a listen. So I figured I'd try Cerberus on it. And basically I took the default setting and tweaked it from there. I initially actually had a few of these boosted and then I realized, man, this was just, you know, adding too much. So here's the before and after. I'll add the plugin while it's playing. And then I added IIEQ Pro. I just did a very steep cut at 40 hertz using the Butterworth HP or high pass filter. Butterworth is my favorite high pass filter and low pass filter. It basically does a very minimum phase job of taking care of things. And it's, it's just, I like it and that's the one I use. Maybe there's a better one out there. I don't know, but Butterworth for me. I also like the name. Reminds me of pancakes. All right, here's the compression. You guys may be surprised to see how much gain reduction I'm using on this. But for those of you who are very experienced, you know the LA-3A can really just eat a bass guitar alive without issue. And then once again, I just forgot to put the Sand 3 preamp on, okay? <laughs> so, yeah. And also, you might notice I don't have a tape plug-in on there. For some reason, I, I just don't like the way tape or tape plug-ins sound with bass guitar. I think bass just sounds better clean. And maybe I'm wrong about that. Maybe I'm being paranoid, but that's just me. So, moving on to the kick drum. Ooh, the kick drum. So, the kick drum actually, I thought, was recorded really well. But, it definitely needed some compression. In fact, judging by these waveforms, I wouldn't be surprised if somebody actually had already compressed this a little bit. Now, some of these do peak higher, but these tracks seem very even. So it's possible that the drummer was actually just very even-footed. But, uh, yeah, anyway, not just for leveling things out, but also getting character, I tend to use, ever since I got it, DBX-160. This is just a great compressor for kick and snare. So, all right, you'll notice that I had a 30 hertz high-pass filter. Again, Butterworth. This one is at a order of 10, so quite steep. And then we have the good old pull tech trick, courtesy of Bass Tard. I like to pronounce it wrong because if I say the other word, YouTube doesn't like it. And there's the DBX. Uh, you know what? I'll just... Mm, yeah, I guess it's okay to do it like this. So th this one you really can't hear unless you have really, really good speakers, but the other ones you can. So let, let's just add these as it plays. All 
And that's it. All the other ones were just choices. And again, I surprised I still had these other plugins on here. I guess I just had them loaded up in case I wanted to change something. But um, yeah, I love the API 560 EQ. And again, the Poltec. So just the fact that I have these to use, I, I, I'm, I'm lucky. I'll just say it like that. And there you go. That's it for the kick drum for now. The overheads were always a point of contention with me because if you look at this, I mean, wow. Like, again, I don't know if they were recorded this loud, but I'll, let me just play this without any plugins. And if I had to adjust it in the video, I will. But yeah. Now, if it wasn't for the darn clipping, this wouldn't be an excellent recording for the most part. Now, I do believe that the drummer either was playing his cymbals too loud, or maybe they just had live cymbals, so bright cymbals, but overall, the recording itself was not horrible, except for it being just too darn, it, it clipped. And here's the problem. Even if you don't clip a track, it still oversaturates your analog to digital converter stage. Because guess what? There is a limit to how far you can push a converter. And the limit I like to go to is like negative 10 at the most for the peaks. And yes, that includes drums. Because guess what? We're using 24-bit converters. A lot of these converters have a noise floor of like negative 120. Uh, some of the, the better ones can go a little bit better, can go a little bit lower than that, but there's absolutely no reason to make something just, you know, 10 decibels louder. You're only losing like, what is that, about 2 bits of information, so you still have a 22-bit recording with a very low noise floor, which is not going to be heard in the mix anyway, so... Ah, see, the person who recorded this did not watch my video, and I'll just leave it at that. So, like, this stuff is fine. Even though it's still peaking that high, it's still better than this stuff. But that also, again, is the symbols just getting in the way of the snare drum. But anyway, let me go to the EQs that I used. Turn this on. So first of all, I used bit shift gain to knock this thing back 12 decibels. Two bits is 12 decibels, approximately. And then we have the filter, just to get rid of the low end. The good old Langvin emulation. I don't know why I remember that, but yeah, Langvin EQs, filters. Okay, so I added some brightness with the API. Actually, let me just add these while I'm playing. Ready? Now, why do I do it like that? Because I want it to stay out of the way of the low mids of the vocals and also the guitars, especially the bass guitar. So you just, you get that muddiness out of the track. You put the cymbals where they should be. And in this case, I was just using two filters. One to do a 240 hertz cut and the other one to do a about 12 kilohertz shelving boost. And it looks like, I thought this was enabled at some point. So I'm gonna put this back on. This is an API 2500 type of emulation. So let's just do a before and after. Back up 
better off doing it on the louder section. I did forget to mention that. I've mentioned it before, but whenever I set these mix prep compressors, I always go for the loudest part of the track and set my thresholds that way. Because I don't want noticeable gain reduction. You see it's compressing, but you don't notice it. You just, you can't hear it. And the great thing about that is, is if you have, you know, one compressor doing, let's say four to six decibels of reduction, and then you put another compressor after that when you're mixing, if you don't have each compressor doing too much of the work at one time, it just sounds better. It sounds more natural, more musical, whatever you want to call it. It's a technique called serial compression. It's something I've been using for a long time now, and I actually did a tutorial video about it. But yeah, this is it in action. I don't think I use the compressor on the overheads during the mix, but doing it this way left the option open. So that's it for the overheads. Now the drum room is... If I go to the routing, it's getting the overhead track. And I actually should have pulled up the overhead in and output. I meant to say drum room, but yeah. So here, I, I'm just getting the overhead input. And the idea is that I'm going to make a fake drum room mic, which I also did a tutorial about that before. And the idea is that I'm sending just the mid-range to the reverb. I don't want that low end. No, I don't. <laughs> I want that going into this, which is a studio reverb unit. Signet Audio, which I believe is closed now, but they did a reverb in that room. So let me just play it for you. So this is the reverb if I didn't have this EQ on. So it just takes up less of the mix by doing this low and high pass. Again, Butterworth high pass and Butterworth low pass. And that, that can be picked right here. Whoops. Let me undo that. <laughs> and then I had this available, but I didn't want to use it during the mix prep. But it was there just to demo. I can delete this now. And yes, I did use SAN 3 Pre. I'll just do a before and after so you can hear it. It just gives me more options to use during the mix, and I definitely did use this during the mix. And if you check out this performance, it's uh, it doesn't eat up a ton of CPU, but it's a good amount. On to the snare drum. Good old Hornet VU meter, first of all. Knock the track back eight decibels. Now, I don't know if this one clipped, but again, it was kind of close. Definitely louder than I would have recorded. So back on, and again, you can really hear that cymbal bleed coming in a lot. You're going to have bleed always, but this is particularly bad. And so on this one, I added clarity with the API 550A equalizer. Actually, I did a lot of work on this track, <laughs> all four bands. So I cut it 200 hertz, and I should note that on my 400 hertz cut, I had the proportional Q button off and that was getting a six decibels cut. And then at 200 hertz, two decibels cut. At five kilohertz, I did a six decibels boost. 
and I did a high shelf cut at 13 kilohertz to reduce that cymbal bleed. So the before and after on this one should be pretty high. And then I did a DBX 160 compression. Fed that into the Slate virtual tape machine plugin. Again, when I'm setting these gain staging type of plugins, I really do try to use the loudest parts of the track. And you'll see what, what I mean by that as it goes from the quieter hits to the louder ones. You have to remember a VU meter does not react as quickly as say a PPM meter. So even though it's only registering maybe up to here, in reality it's here. Any type of transient track is actually registering higher than what the VU meter shows. And then finally, I had this going into Slate VCC. And I think VCC's VU meter is not like a real one. But anyway, <laughs> moving on to the next track, actually the, the last two tracks, I'll show both of them at the same time. I'll, let me find a good spot. All right, so the high tom drum, I actually put sand on because I ended up using it in the mix anyway, and I figured I'd save a little bit of CPU by coming back to the mix prep session and just doing it here. And in this case, I was just adding some 7 kilohertz boost at about 4 to 5 decibels. It should be noted that the Q factor or the bandwidth was definitely tight. And that was heading into an LA3A compressor, into VTM, and then finally into Slate VCC. So I, I don't always use sand for the preamp because it's still relatively new to me. <laughs> so anyway, let's check it out. Let's check out before and after, except for VU meter, I don't wanna that was another thing, the tom drums, if you looked, they are either clipped or almost clipped. And actually you can see that on the VU meter, it reduced it to negative 10, which means that yes, it was either clipped or very close to it. Again, just finding that loudest part of the track and setting the compressor to where it's not really changing the tone too much or not at all. As for the floor tom, let's see what I did with that. Hornet. Again, it was peaking at, at zero almost, and I ended up using an API EQ. I boosted at 100 hertz, two decibels, and using the API 550B equalizer module. This one also got an LA3A, and there you go. Let's check it out before and after. Finally, V. And that really is it for the mix prep. I will go on to the actual final mix that I released, which 
is a little bit different than the one that I put up in the YouTube video. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs>